out on the open plains, shelters had to rise fast, or the cold would win first. A tippy could go from bare earth to full height in just a few hours. But here's the part that stops you for a moment. That same quick-built frame could stand through high winds, frost-line nights, and storms that tested everything a family owned. The wind didn't shout out here. It scraped the ground in a low, steady path, the way winter always does. I've felt that earth cold climb up your legs before the gusts even touch the poles. And when you stand close to an old campsite, you can still see traces in the soil, quiet knowledge left behind. They weren't building culture, they were engineering survival. Stone hard poles, hide warm walls, angles shaped for the wind. So the real question is simple. What exact method made this possible? And where did they find every material out on the empty plains? Out on the plains, the cold didn't fall from the sky. It rose from the earth, then rode the wind scraping across the frost line. And if a teepee was going to stand in that kind of weather, its poles had to be chosen with the same care a man uses when placing his foot on ice. I've handled old lodgepole pine before. Run your hand down a good one and you feel it instantly straight as a gun barrel smooth balanced. That straightness mattered, too thin, and the wind bent it until it broke, too thick, and no one could carry it miles back to camp. A tipai was mobile engineering. The wood had to match the mission. Now picture felling a 20-foot pine with a stone axe. It wasn't like cutting wood today. It was closer to digging a swimming pool with a spoon. Every swing cost energy. Every cut had to count. Miss once and winter caught up to you. I've seen tool marks on old stumps, deep patient blows, left by people who knew cold wouldn't wait. They weren't just looking for wood. They were choosing the spine of the entire structure. Teepee poles carried storm weight, hide weight, and smoke rise pressure at the same time. If one failed, the whole shelter failed. That's survival math. Archaeologists once found a cluster of cutting sites near a winter camp. All the stumps were the same size, same angle, same clean break. Proof the builders knew exactly what they needed, not just trees, but the right trees. That's the quiet knowledge behind every teepee. Before anything rose from the ground, the wood had to be right. Only the best poles ever made it home. Out on the plains, a shelter didn't begin with hides or a fire pit. It began with three poles, three pieces of wood chosen with the same care you'd use picking the last solid branch before crossing a frozen creek. I've handled old tripod poles before. You know the good ones the moment you lift them, straight enough to read the wind, strong enough to take its weight. Those three poles weren't random choices. They were the backbone. And choosing the wrong ones was worse than circling the wrong answer on a final exam because one mistake didn't cost you points, it cost you the whole shelter. Storm winds on the open plains could knock a grown man off his feet. I felt that push. Cold pressure hitting low on the legs then driving upward. If a teepee was going to stand in wind like that, the tripod had to be, in every sense of the word, bulletproof. So the builders set the three poles, first crossing them high overhead, tying them tight with rawhide that bit into the wood. Only when that triangle of strength was standing firm did the rest of the frame begin to rise, pole by pole, angle by angle, until the structure curved into a circle meant to catch the wind bend with it and guide it around the shelter instead of through it. That's survival math, not luck. But before any of this could happen, there was a problem people today rarely think about. These poles were 20 feet long. You don't tuck something like that under your arm and stroll home. Transporting them from the cutting grounds to the camp was its own battle. Dragging, carrying, balancing mile after mile of open ground where the wind had its own ideas. I've seen the wear marks on old poles. They tell a quiet story of distance weight and patience. That's the reality behind every teepee frame. Before the hides, before the fire, before the warmth, the bones had to be right. And the tripod had to be perfect. Out on the plains, a teepee didn't begin with wood or rope. It began with a hunt. And hunting buffalo wasn't a calm walk through grass, it was like chasing freight trains with horns and winter in their bones. I've stood on old buffalo paths. 
you can still feel the earth packed hard from thousands of hooves. That's the first lesson nothing about this part was easy. A buffalo didn't drop from a single spear. It took timing, teamwork, and a whole community moving as one. When a hunt started, every moment mattered. Riders pushed from the flanks, runners guided the herd, and the entire plane depended on a single perfect moment. Miss it, and you didn't just lose a hide, you risked lives. Buffalo were far stronger than most people imagine today. I've touched rib bones dug from old winter camps, thick heavy, built to outlast storms. But once a hunt succeeded, the real work started. A fresh hide is nothing like leather. It's soaked with moisture hair, fat, and tissue. Two people can barely lift one. Standing beside a new carcass in cold air, you understand why the old one said the hide felt alive with weight. Women usually took over from there. They scraped and thinned the hide with stone blades, sharp enough to bite, but steady enough not to tear. The long, shallow marks from that work still show on hide fragments in museums and dig sites. That's how a teepee skin began, not as fabric, but as the toughest layer an animal ever carried. And before it warmed, a single family, every inch, had to be earned by hand in the cold. Out on the plains, the wind could peel warmth off a body the way a blade lifts shavings from wood. A tippy's cover had to stop that wind cold, but a fresh buffalo hide didn't begin as protection, it began as a heavy, wet, stubborn weight that fought you at every step. I've lifted raw hide in winter. It feels like picking up a soaked rug lined with ice, thick, slippery, heavy with earth cold. And that was only the start. Turning it into a wall strong enough to block frost line winds took hours, sometimes days of steady labor. The first step was scraping. Women used stone blades sharp enough to bite, but steady enough not to tear, shaving off hair, fat, and tissue. Those long, shallow marks still appear on hide fragments in museums, quiet proof of real hands working in real cold. But scraping only opened the door to the harder work. The hides were soaked, stretched, and pulled tight until they stopped fighting the rope. Then came brain tanning, a method as old as winter. Warm brain mixture softened and sealed the fibers, giving the hide the flexibility to survive wind scraping across the plains. I've seen pieces treated this way tougher than most modern leather and lighter too. Drying, smoking, and stitching came last. Animal gut became thread strong enough to pull edges together. Smoke hardened the fibers and made the hide shed water instead of drinking it in. It was never just throwing a hide over a frame. It was hand-built engineering. Every inch earned, every step essential. And before a teepee warmed a single family, the cover had to survive the work that made it strong. Out on the plains, wind didn't just move past you. It pushed, it crawled. It scraped along the ground until every loose thing learned to hold on or disappear. Trying to lift a buffalo hide cover in that kind of wind was like trying to dress a giant while standing on a ladder in a storm. I've been in gusts like that. Your hands feel slow. Your breath feels thin. Everything fights you. But the families who built tepees turned that chaos into a system, a practiced rhythm. Everyone knew their place, their task, their moment. The hide rose inch by inch, pulled tight against the tripod, guided by people who had done it a hundred times before. And the raw hide laces that was another kind of engineering. They were cut from the same buffalo that made the cover, then worked until they were tough enough to hold the storm weight, but flexible enough to tighten or loosen when the weather shifted. I've held old laces like that. They look simple, but don't be fooled. They grip wood like a clamp, yet move just enough to keep the hide from tearing. The whole binding system had one job. Hold the heavy hide tight. Never let it sag. Never let it slip. But also allow the family to make quick adjustments when the wind changed direction because out here, the wind always changed. You can still see hints of that work today. Marks on old poles where rawhide bit deep. Smooth patches where hands pulled the hide tight. Traces in the soil where stones once anchored the skirt of the cover. None of this was guesswork. It was survival math done in real time in real weather by people who understood the storm better than the storm understood them.
Out on the plains, the weather didn't make slow decisions. A morning could sit calm as a thin fire, and by afternoon, the wind was scraping the ground hard enough to lift dust straight into your eyes. I felt days like that when the air shifts fast and the storm tests everything you built. That's why a teepee's anchor system was never set and forget. The rawhide laces, the wooden pegs, the stone rings around the base, all of it had to stay ready for whatever the sky decided next. When the wind picked up, families tightened the laces. When the gusts changed direction, they shifted the stones. When the smoke pulled wrong through the top, they adjusted the flaps. Experienced hands could make these changes in moments without tearing down the shelter. Just quick, precise movements, the kind that come from living with the weather, not against it. Some tribes even used special lacing patterns for extreme conditions, adding extra anchor points and cross bindings so the hide gripped the frame like a second skin. I've seen those patterns marked on old hides. Quiet knowledge stitched into the material itself. That's how the teepee stayed standing, not by resisting the storm, but by staying ready for the next move the storm would make. Step inside a teepee on a winter morning and you understand something fast. This wasn't just a shelter, it was a workshop built for survival, shaped by cold smokestone and instinct. The hide walls had to earn their place. They shed water instead of soaking it in. They kept out insects, mice, and the drift of frost line winds. And when it was time to move, they came down fast. A design meant for people who lived with weather that never sat still. Everything inside served a purpose. Bone tools hung close to the fire pit, each made from the skeletons of animals taken in the hunt. Ribs became scrapers. Shin bones became awls. Different bones for different jobs. Quiet knowledge learned over generations. Wooden tools filled in where bone couldn't. People chose local woods the way a mechanic chooses the right wrench, not for beauty, but for behavior. Some bent well near heat. Some resisted cracking in earth-cold nights. And the stone tools they handled what neither wood nor bone could survive. Grinding, cutting, pounding. I've seen the wear marks on old stones from these camps. They tell a story of constant use, constant need. Inside a teepee, nothing was for decoration. Every object, every placement, every choice was part of the survival math. A small space, yes, but one tuned perfectly to the storm outside. Out on the plains, moving camp wasn't a slow decision. When the herd shifted or the weather turned, a family had to be ready to break everything down fast, but never carelessly. A teepee wasn't just taken apart. It was unloaded like a vital piece of gear that had to survive the next storm. The hide came off first, and you couldn't just yank it down. A wrong pull stretched the fibers. A bad fold made a weak crease, the kind that tore later when the wind scraped hard across it. I've handled old hides with those scars. They tell you exactly who folded right and who didn't. Folded correctly, though the hide packed small, tight, and safe. Rawhide laces were coiled on their own, kept dry, so they wouldn't twist or crack. Only then did the poles come down. Each one lowered by hand, not dropped. The wood checked for split bends or wear marks where raw hide had bitten deep. Those marks matter. They tell you how the pole will behave in the next build. That was the whole system, a shelter you could take apart, carry, rebuild, and trust again. Not a house, a reusable survival tool inspected every time like equipment your life depended on.